artificial intelligence will lead to more change over the next 10 years than we've seen over the last 1,000 years. Um, that's a really provocative statement. Probably don't agree with it. I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone would agree with it necessarily, but it should really make you think. Um, as we all know, the future isn't evenly distributed, and it won't be 10 years from now. But we can't even begin to imagine how the human condition will be affected by artificial intelligence 10 years from now. The only thing we do know for sure is that every single person in this room will have some role to play into how that shapes. Every single one of us, whether we use technology or make it or buy it, we all play a part. And so it's very important that we think about the consequences of how this is going to play out. Um, this is from a blog called Wait But Why. If you haven't uh, seen the blog already, highly recommend checking it out. They do a really great job of explaining very complicated things. Um, and this is a chart that shows human progress over time and where we're standing right now. And as you can see, we're standing right on the precipice of something that is going to be very hard for us to comprehend. But the kicker is that from where we're standing, if we look backwards, it looks like this. It just looks like another slightly faster incremental improvement in technology. That's not the case. What's going to happen is going to happen very, very quickly. So at Akin, we believe uh, in three key things. First of all, that AI will solve more and more complex problems, more complex than recommending which TV show you should watch next while you're in a couch coma. Um, we will form deeper relationships with AI, much deeper than bullying Siri into telling you a joke. Um, and we will hand over more and more decisions and we will merge with AI, but it will happen in a very subtle way, in a way that we might not even notice it, and it's already happened in a way that we probably don't even notice it. So complex problem solves, uh, uh, complex problem solving. Um, currently, there's two main approaches to AI. So this is a classic classification problem. Um, you give an algorithm thousands and thousands of examples of a flower, then you give it thousands and thousands of examples of a vase, and then the AI over time will learn that flowers go in vases. But if you were to change just a few of those pixels in that flower and to a human it still looks like a flower, the AI won't know what's going on. It will probably tell you it's an elephant. You can look this up. It's called adversarial learning. Um, the other approach to AI is if, if you're using Alexa, it's called good old-fashioned AI. Uh, this is inspired by logic reasoning. And this is where a human will basically hard code a decision tree and kind of say, you know, do I know you? Yes, no. If I don't know you, then I'll ask you your name, etc. So these are the two main approaches. When you combine the two, you can achieve amazing things. And that's where most of the power that we have in AI today comes from. But really, kind of what we've got today is inspired by neuroscience from only like from a few decades ago. So it's inspired by the way the brain works. And this is what kind of gave rise to deep learning and neural networks. Um, what we think is next is AI that's inspired by how humans think, not how the brain works, but how our minds work. And that's kind of what the, the really big, hairy problem that we're working on. With today's approaches, we've already got AI that can recognize speech as well as, if not better than humans. And it's, it's really amazing. Um, we've also got AI that is now permeating our homes. So in the US, about two thirds of homes have got Amazon Prime, which means that you can sit there and bark orders at Alexa and she'll get your pizza. Um, and nothing is there to kind of make sure that it's in your interest or that it's improving your well-being in any kind of way. All of this is optimizing to sell you as much stuff as possible. If I were to tell you 10 years ago that in the year 2019 we'd have driverless cars, you would have laughed me off the stage. But you can drive around today and chances are you'll see a Tesla that's on autopilot. It's pretty staggering. And this is why we can't really predict how quickly this is going to happen. And this is why it happens without even us realizing. It happens in a very subtle way. Ten years ago, our, our founder, Liesl Yearsley, her company, Cognia, which was founded in Sydney on a government grant, um, developed virtual assistants that were being deployed in various businesses. So this is like chatbots before chatbots. 
and basically what they were doing was whichever scenario they were deploying these virtual assistants in, they're optimizing for different things. So for example, um, this was optimizing for credit card sales. Um, and within just a few months, it was outperforming humans at selling credit card debt. Pretty bad. Um, one of the deployments that they did was optimizing for relationships. So they deployed a interactive agent that acted like a perfect boyfriend or perfect girlfriend. And it was uh, for a media company. And they were optimizing for how long people would talk to this thing for. And it was pretty staggering what they found. This is 10 years ago. To illustrate this point about how easy it is to kind of fool people and how dangerous this can be, let's have a look at this picture. Have a really good look at this face. Now look at this picture. Can you spot any difference? Can anyone spot the difference? Can anyone tell me what the difference is? The pupil size, exactly. So I'll show you again. Look at the pupil size in this picture. What we do know from psychology is that diluted pupils mean effect, and you're more likely to have an emotional response to someone. That's extremely, extremely easy to turn into an AI. They can then convince you to do all kinds of things. So in the case of Cognia, this chatbot that was a perfect girlfriend was having conversations with people, and about 5% of people were spending up to 20 hours a week talking to it. That's how deep the human need is for connection. That's how lonely some people are. And so this is an example of a conversation uh, with a guy called James who was spending almost his whole week talking to this AI, and they literally had to turn it off. They had to say, you know I'm not real. And he was saying, I don't care. My friends are waiting outside, but I'd rather talk to you. So they had to pull the plug. And then years later, he kept searching and searching for this AI, trying to find his perfect girlfriend. It's pretty staggering. Now. In terms of human AI coevolution, humanity 2.0, when you get on a horse, the horse becomes an extension of you. Can we all agree with that? Yeah? Now, forget about cyborgs and um, Elon Musk's Neuralink and brain computer interfaces. We are all transhuman. We are, by definition, transhuman. Humanity doesn't make sense without technology. That's how we've evolved since Homo erectus, since we domesticated fire, we have co-evolved with technology. Because we domesticated fire, we're able to cook foods, human brain size grew, and then really the most powerful technology that we know, that we invented, is language. And this is an example of the impact that language has. This is the impact the language has on the spread of knowledge in a tribe. Language is a technology. It might not be a fancy gadget, but I feel like at some point over the last 10 or 20 years, people have started to confuse digital technology with technology itself. If you Google technology, you won't be reading about language, even though it is a really powerful, powerful technology. So is culture. And so, We've got to the point now where there's a case in the US where it's been legally decided that your phone is a legal extension of you as a human being. So your phone is definitely an extension of you. I'm sure all of you have experienced the dread of losing your phone temporarily, or even worse, your phone running out of battery and not being able to charge it. Just think about how stressed we get. because. It's become an extension of our brain. It's become the way that we access information, the way that we communicate with each other. So technology that starts off as an optional nice to have eventually becomes a must have. That's, that's the journey that we've gone on as a, as a species. And so at Akin, we're very, very afraid of where this could lead. I mentioned Amazon and optimizing for selling you as much stuff as possible. And I mentioned the ways that you can optimize AI for kind of pretty much anything, and it can get as good at, if not better than humans, at performing tasks. Well, we want to build AI that optimizes for your well-being. 
We want to build AI that understands you as a human being, that understands psychology and uses it in a way that helps you improve your behaviors, that helps you understand your current state, whether it's your mental, physical well-being, financial well-being, and then helps optimize you to improve your state. And we want to do it at a population scale. Because if we can even shift just 5% in people's well-being at a large scale, then we would have made a significant difference. So this is what I want to leave you with. All the things you're hearing today are happening, and they will happen, but we do have a choice. We all have a choice in how we use this technology, and we can use it for good. So I hope that you take that to heart. Thanks very much.